is that? <laughs> that's hilarious. All right. That's something to fix. <laughs> I think I was just... So the, the I NPR. call my agent not to book me on any things like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's very Lucinda Williams. Her wheels on a gravel road. I, I feel it. <laughs> that's a good That's a good beginning. So um, we are joined by uh, three guests today. Um, Catherine Pilfrey, Jim Rosen, and Matthew Bellows. And... We, uh, we all happen to be, myself included, um, part of this online meditation group. Um, we are sort of the instructors or the keepers of time and the, uh, the givers of wisdom at the beginning of, of the meditation. And we've been meeting on Zoom for almost three years now. And um, Jim Rosen, I know because he was uh, my first, uh, well, my, my meditation teacher. He's taught me. Um, Catherine Pilfrey, actually, the very first time I went to sit down in a meditation hall, uh, she was presiding, keeping time, giving wisdom. Uh, Matthew Bellows, I met through the greater Buddhist community here in Boston, and, um, and we've been working together for a good while now. So let's see what we think we have something to say about it. And Lionel is here, and Lionel has uh, kind of no connection to meditation at all. So I think that's actually good opportunity. So um, I thought we'd start with a with a general question if, if maybe you guys have guys y'all have uh, an idea for a, a, a starting question to someone who doesn't meditate. What would it be? Why would you meditate? Yeah. Yeah, we'll bring it to you. Lionel. <laughs> yes. Over to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard I, I heard two things. I heard keeping time and giving wisdom. Were those semi facetious or are those true things? This is my this was this was my, you know, my explanation of what we do. We are you know, I guess we call ourselves teachers, which it sort of seems a little lofty. Um, but but the truth is, I've been meditating for, oh boy, 20, 21 years, 20, 24 years now um, uh, in, in, in the Buddhist practice. Um, Jim, you started meditating. When was that? How long ago? About 50 years ago. 50, five zero years ago. A little shocking. Wow, and Depends Catherine won't count too. But um, how did you? What? How long have you been practicing, Catherine? Um, you know, I'm coming up on forty years. Wow, which is shocking. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the newbie, really. And Matt, <laughs> and Matt, when did you get started? Uh, my first, my meeting? first meditation class was in the fall of 1990. So coming up on 20. Five years. 35 years. 35 years. 35 years, yeah. Time flies. <laughs> so time, time, is like a, is not a strong time, time is a uh, <laughs> time is a construct as we know. So that's right. Um, but again, I heard keeping time yep. and giving wisdom. Yeah, keeping time is not my strong suit. Well, what is keeping time? I thought meditation is meant to be unconstrained. I, I mean, it just, it, it interests me that there's some kind of boundary around it. Oh my God. So I, I can go for a long time on keeping time. Um, not so much on giving wisdom, but keeping time is very helpful for meditators because um, so much of what meditation is, is like knowing that you can stop at some point. It's, it's very hard for people to start meditating. And so to have a timekeeper to say, um, you know, five minutes more, 10 minutes more, you know, to respond to your goal and say, I'm going to just take care of the end point for you so that you can concentrate on the practice is actually really, really helpful. I think there's another dimension to it, too. I think that if you think back to the origin of the class, what one thing we did that was pretty unusual, I've never, I have since seen a class, but made the class just 30 minutes long 
to make it like really easy to say yes to. I mean, and that was really the inspiration because they're usually 60 or 90 minutes long per class. And so the idea, and I worked, we work really hard actually to keep it to 30 minutes and to give a talk and do meditation. It actually takes some, you need to be mindful and watch the clock um, and to sort of keep that promise to people, we'll get you out of here by 9.30 a.m. And giving wisdom, do, do people speak during meditation class? That's actually really interesting. That this is a, so I just want to say, I was being facetious when I was saying giving wisdom. However, okay, there is some truth to it in that, in that, you know, we've all been studying um, Buddhist teachings for a long time. So if there's wisdom, it comes from that. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, of course, from our own, whatever we can add to it, uh, we do our best. But uh, we are, even though it's an online meditation group that's open to anyone, we are teaching on some fairly heavy subjects that go back, well, 1500 years or, you know, somewhere in that range. More. Well, yeah, right. No, that's true. The six parameters, so 2,500 years, uh, all the way back to the Buddha. Um, four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, yeah. And we, so we talk about topics, not just why are we all feeling stressed, um, but we kind of have been digging into traditional teachings. So during the, the meditation class, is there sort of like a talking time and then there's a meditation time? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And during the meditation time, I assume that talking is kept to a minimum. I'm serious. I'm just coming to this from ground zero here. Yeah. 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 And Lionel, in, in round terms, we have like talk for about 10 minutes, give or take. And okay. we do about 20 minutes of meditation. And how has that worked out? You mentioned that you were, you were trying to keep it under 30 minutes, whereas the standard was 60 or 90. How, how has that worked out? Oh, um, I wasn't there right from the start. Um, but we have a nice group of people that, you know, come fairly regularly. So that 30 minute um, chunk of time uh, is, is just kind of, manageable for people i think and and then there's a few minutes afterwards where some people stay and we just chat or have a discussion and so that sort of built this nice um community aspect to it as well so okay and the last noob question you you spend 10 minutes at the the front talk and is there a theme to the meditation that follows is that sort of what part of the discussion at the top is about is so not all meditation is the same. There's like a theme to it or there's, there's some kind of topic to it. I mean, some kind of idea behind it or do I have that completely messed up? Yeah, they're related. And I mean, the talks are usually sometimes the meditation is directly on the subject of the talk, but sometimes the talks are also about bringing the meditation into daily life. So they're, uh, about broader topics as well. Okay. Yeah, we're we're all longtime meditators, but I think the the one of the things that unites the four of us as we teach is just an interest in normal daily life. Like none of us are monks, none of us are you know living in monasteries. We all have jobs and have families and partners and you know the struggles with the normal American life. So we, you're in the world. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's really like a big part of how we teach is like, how does meditation fit for people who, you know, live in the world? And so all of you are teachers. So it's not, so do each of you have individual groups that you lead in meditation or do you work together on this? Do you work as a team? Well, we work as a team. We we rotate. So we each okay. teach. Um, we do it Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, and then we we each teach like every two weeks um, that way. Okay. And I think, Lionel, one of the really nice qualities of the group is all four of us teach in a pretty different way. I mean, probably at the heart, you know, we're all pointing at the same thing, and we come from similar meditation backgrounds and education, but 
I think it just lends some real richness. And I'm sure kind of the participants really like that aspect to, of it. And and is and Jim, just stop me if I'm asking too many no, questions. They're great. Just, you don't no. have to kick my legs under the tail. Is is all of this are is this all rooted in the Buddhist tradition of meditation? Or did some of you come to meditation from a different direction? Um it's all well, I, I'll let other people speak for themselves, but I think it's I think of it as Buddhist rooted and Buddhist inspired, but you definitely do not need to be a Buddhist or sign up for anything whatsoever. And that's been a very, I think, kind of unites us kind of in that view. It's meant to be very accessible, and, and we're really explicit about that. But it's the talks are certainly informed by Buddhist views, and we talk about the Buddha and things like that. Um, so that's not like, we kind of go out of our, I, I think it was like going a little out of our way to make sure there's kind of no hidden agenda. Because sometimes, you know, people, it can be a little frightening to walk into a meditation group. Sometimes you think like you don't know what you're trying to be drawn into or, you know. What's the agenda here? Yeah, what's the right. agenda? And we are... Um, I think this group, sometimes I call it the no guilt group, <laughs> that, you know, you're welcome to drop in and participate and try, and, and what you do with it or not is really entirely for you. And I think that's actually creates a really healthy environment, and, and I'm pretty sure people appreciate that. Um, I don't know if it's been said, but this is all, our um, group is called Mindful Aware, and it's happening on Zoom. So um, this got started when Jim Rosen uh, brought up the idea of meditation during the pandemic. And, um, you know, all of the public places where we might gather in person were closed. And so he was saying, well, is, is there some way that we could start leading, med well, that he could start leading a meditation uh, session on Zoom, like remotely, and people were just sort of getting on Zoom at that time. Uh, this was maybe March of 2020. Yeah, I looked it up actually because I knew it would come up. And it was the first class was the last week of March. So very early on. Yeah, it was, sort of it was very much born when the lockdown started for the pandemic. And it was really this sort of, you know, two streams. You know, I like a lot of people, I was looking around like, it was such a crazy extreme time. It's like, what can I do that'd be helpful? And people were asking me to do it. You know, I ran, um, I'd done a lot of work in Matt's old company and, and I staffed a meditation group that both Catherine, you know, and Jim and Matt and myself all taught on. So the head of HR in the company sent me an email saying, everyone home wants something to go to. Could you help? And there were three or four other people who reached out. So I just felt like it had been on my mind to do this for a while, but it just felt, how could you say no, kind of given the circumstances. Uh, Matt started a really cool company uh, downtown and, and they had a meditation room uh, in the company, in the office building. So um, Catherine, Jim, and myself would go and uh, lead meditation. Uh, I think, it was, was it once or twice a week? I forget how often it was happening, but there were cushions. It was all set up. It was, it was pretty swank, but uh, Matt, did you, was that, was that entirely you uh, who decided to set that up? Yeah. Pretty much everyone else at the company was like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> 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 and I was like, the room will be over here and we'll have a bamboo floor and we'll order the mats from this company and the cushions from this company. And, <laughs> and everyone was like, uh, okay. I guess you T service. <laughs> there must be T service. <laughs> no one really knows. You only to do. get to do that if you're the president. You have to be the, the CEO. Founders, yeah. you know? <laughs> oh my God. We we used to make the VCs bow at the beginning of board meetings and they had no oh. idea what to do. It was so funny. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, VC is well, venture capitalists, sorry. Venture cap yeah, that and they're you know, big into Buddhism, most venture capitalists. Um, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> sure they are. <laughs> I thought, 
<laughs> you know, the no self thing. Oh my um, God. Yeah. Totally low ego. Yeah. Low ego. Yeah. yeah. Just, just destroy that ego. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe we could, since Lionel is not a meditator, we could try to explain to, 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 well, try to give some definition of what meditation is or, you know, some idea of what, uh, what to expect, uh, to, you know, if you were to start meditating, what, what and why, and what is it not? What is it? Um, Catherine, would you, do you have a, mm -hmm. uh, well, a I, when you say why meditate, I keep thinking, why not meditate? I mm. always, I always feel like I have so many friends and know so many people that suffer from anxiety and I think like meditation just has totally saved my life, you know, for all these years. Like I, I really can't imagine, um, you know, the person I would be without it. Like it just is, um, such a lifeline to feeling more sane and more relaxed and more able to cope with things that come up. And, um, like, like when the pandemic started, I had the practice of meditation. I just, you know, continued and I, I was, I was nervous some, and even my partner is an ER doctor. So that was very stressful worrying that he might, die you know on the job and but still because of the practice i always had you know something to sort of come back to and those sort of moments of anxiety would be there but then they would pass and um i just think it's so invaluable to just sort of living a more sort of relaxed life just managing that's a great why Um, Matt, do you have yeah, a, a what or I why? I have a, another why, which is, I think, very closely related. But um, <clears throat> one way to think about meditation is as a scientific experiment on yourself. And the experiment is, what would happen if I didn't constantly put entertainment in front of my face? What would, what would my mind do? And so meditation is like carving out a little space for 10 or 20 minutes a day where you just sit by yourself in a quiet place and don't constantly feed yourself with entertainment and just see what your mind does in that environment. And um, it's kind of totally different from how we normally live our life. And I, I feel like that's a valuable experience for any human being to have. That is a what and why. Jim, do you have a, a, a why or what meditation is? Well, or? I mean, building maybe on top of what Matt said, you know, I think when you do that, what you find, it's like you said, it's a way to truly see yourself in your inner world. And you might, it's not uncommon not to particularly like what you see when you first sit down. It's always been going on, but it's, it can be a little shocking. Um, and it's not uncommon, actually, when people first start to meditate, they may say even like, this is making everything worse because they're starting to become aware of, you know, what's actually running through their mind. But if I think if you stay with it and underneath this, you know, um, sooner or later, you'll touch the, kind of the best in you, you know, and you'll become aware of the natural qualities of your mind, you know, which are qualities like ease and courage and compassion and insight. Um, so you start to become, maybe it's a way to start to become acquainted with um, some of the undercurrents that kind of we're usually missing because, you know, we're just so busy and so speedy. So ultimately, I think it empowers you to live, you know, a life of purpose because you know when you kind of get out of your way sometimes people describe it like a trance you're in you start to see um that you know you can start to be a lot more insightful and intentional and aware of what's going on and be able to you know 
benefit yourself and others in um, that of sort of causing at least some of the trouble we tend to cause for ourselves and others. Yeah, you know, like Kath- Catherine started from a very fruitional point of view, like the benefits. Um, and I think Jim is talking about the sort of the sort of path aspect. Of, like we all know this feeling. We all we it meditation is not a Buddhist thing. Meditation is a human thing. Being human means being aware, and and we all have these experiences of when suddenly we feel connected. We feel connected to the earth we feel connected to the environment to our friends around us to ourselves to our deepest truth and everything kind of clicks into place and those moments are just fleeting and rare and so beautiful in life and one way to look at meditation is to cultivate the state of the presence of mind the awareness such that you can recognize when that's happening to you and appreciate it you know so you actually appreciate your life more so that that reminds me of um, I think what, when it, what, my experience of meditation was I just sort of um I was I was on a, a two week long retreat where we were sitting uh, all day long and um, uh, not talking so it even it was a silent meditation retreat so there wasn't even talking in between you know like at, at lunch and and all of the the rest. And uh, somewhere in there, I was sitting and I thought, oh, no, am I going to have to experience every second of this day? <laughs> and um, right. a panic <laughs> came over me. I, I wanted to leap out of the, off, well, out of the, off the cushion. I wanted to run around and scream. But um, that was, in a sense, that's it. I mean, what's the alternative? We're missing so much of our lives, right? So in meditation, you're actually, the idea is to be there. Now, if the mind is being weird and doing its thing, well, you're there, you're there for it. And if, you know, uh, your body has like an ache somewhere, you're there with that. And you're, you are there every second of the day. Um, so that can be very, I agree, that can be really uncomfortable, I think, when you get started. Because we're so used to distracting ourselves. I want it as maybe as a person who started this dream of you might not like what you see. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, it's really important to note that the emphasis is on doing this with a sense of relaxation and self compassion and ease. You know, it's not some grim, like put up with all your craziness kind of activity and, and, and grind your teeth or grin and bear it. Not at all. And I think part of our job as meditation teachers is to create a space where people can do that, you know, where they feel safe, to kind of let go and be present and not beat themselves up and not judge themselves um, and just bring some simple presence to whatever thoughts, sensation, and emotions are occurring with them. Um, my teacher, you know, our teacher, Chuck and Tripp, I used to say kind of not being afraid of who you are or the spirit behind the whole thing. One thing that strikes me is that usually when we record the podcast, there's kind of a frenetic activity of, uh, of conversation. And, um, as soon as we started, it was <laughs> Just amazing to see how the whole thing kind of chilled out. We are, I, I'm, I'm very impressed, uh, and I'm very honored actually to be working with with all three of you, um, because you do have a very calming presence. Now, does that make a good podcast? I don't know. That's all right. <laughs> right? That's it what, is what I it thought is. when you suggested it. I was like, is this going to be interesting? <laughs> I, I, you know, honestly, Lionel and I don't care. It has just has to be. <laughs> Something that you know, we might be interested in, in talking Have about. Have you heard our other podcast? <laughs> Trust me. This is this is like this is like Miami Vice compared to some of our episodes. Trust. <laughs> We're not burdened with popularity at this point. Right. Um, We're good. Actually, We're good. I listened to your Dar Williams one, which was really interesting and cool. And um, 
And also I listened to the one with your brother, which was also fascinating. So I I listened to the year end one and uh, Mm. I was like, oh my God, I cannot get on a, get on a call with these guys. They've read all these books with all these cool authors and I haven't read any of them. And (gasps) please. (laughs) (laughs) Lionel, yeah, Lionel, I say in that podcast that Lionel has definitely gotten me reading more. Um, But that, and that's the fun of it. Um, for me, is that I, I've had to kind of invest something into that, um, but I think I think you know between all of us, we have a, a good deal to offer in terms of our experience. It's a rarefied experience leading a meditation with uh, people around the country and at some point across the world. Although the time zone kind of limits that, um, but how do you feel that it's been received? I I always I get the sense that I can never know. However much I feel like I've been really clear or, or, you know, Catherine, you've been really clear on something. We get some feedback at the end during the chat with some people, but I really don't know how. Uh, sometimes there are comments on our, on our bulletin board that make me think, oh, wow. So we need to maybe explain this even more. <laughs> um, there's just yeah. such a wide variety of how it comes across the 10-minute talk and then the 20-minute sit. Yeah, someone someone a while ago made the comment about how I still can't empty my mind of all my yeah. thoughts. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> <How is> this? <laughs> yeah. That's a common misconception, Lionel. Have you heard that? Is that, the, you know, the meditation is about, like, turning off your thoughts? No, I mean, but what I find fascinating is this idea that it's communal, and that you can do it over cyberspace. So my, as someone who knows nothing about meditation, my idea is that uh, my, my first image of it is that it's a solitary practice. And that if it's a communal practice, it is like you, like you and I were talking about a couple episodes ago, it, it you know, Quakerism, the, the whole silent meeting thing, you know, it's in person. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around doing group meditation over the internet, but I'm sure that's because I have constrained. I mean, because I know nothing. Um, And I, so enlighten me, you know, to, you know, to, to at the most simple level, a person might, might convince themselves that meditation is just sit still, don't say anything, close your eyes and do the do that for X number of minutes, but it's much more than that. So enlighten me. W- what is it? I mean, well, careful with that. Careful with that I phrase. Hate, I hate saying what is it, but I'm just saying uh, perhaps the better way to approach this is how, how can you translate that to cyberspace? How can you tra- I mean, how can you actually do it over? Cause to me, that seems like a really long stretch. Yeah, weirdly, it's not. Um, obviously, none of us did this before the pandemic. We we never would have thought to do it over Zoom. I don't. Um, I don't think I had done an online meditation course before that. But now um, I just did a weekend program with Anup Tupton, who's in California, and he's a Tibetan teacher and. All these teachers do online meditation programs now. And so um, somehow it does work. But the other, the other piece of talking about it being solitary, it's actually so much easier and somewhat more, I mean, more powerful is maybe not quite right. But there's some energy that is really potent in practicing with other people. And... The group aspect, certainly when you're in physical proximity, there's a sense of discipline and sort of shared experience that you're sort of, you're doing this together, almost like a yoga class or something, you know, but you're, um, you're, or, or church, you know, that you're sharing in this, um, in this together. And it translates over Zoom as well, it turns out. Yeah, I think we were all pretty surprised that it worked. Yeah, yeah. I, I really feel that COVID, in some ways, 
really benefited kind of the dispersion of these teachings mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people in the community, just like you said, Lionel, were skeptical that it could be done this way. And when it when COVID hit and there was this sort of moment where they kind of had to, people had to make a decision, are we going to shut down teaching or are we going to support our communities? People started, you know, including some very traditional teachers who were born in rural Tibet, which is, you know, it was not that different than medieval Europe, um, say 25 years ago. And, um, and I think it's worked, you know, remarkably well. I just did my first in-person retreat in three years a couple of months ago, and that was really nice, too, uh, to be in a room with other people. But what does that, you know, uh, it, this is fascinating to me, but what does it say about the human mind? I mean, if you sit in a room with a bunch of people, and then you sit in front of a screen, and I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm a peasant here, that... I mean, when you meditate, do you close your eyes? Yes and no. Okay. Um, do we, uh, we actually we actually came out of a tradition, all, all four of us, that uh, where you meditate with your eyes open. But that I think for for the style of teaching that we're giving, it's it's uh, relaxed. So when you're doing a Zoom, I'm sorry, and, and you can stop me at any time if I'm just really trampling all, all over something. No. But if you're doing this Zoom meditation, I assume just like right now while we're talking, there's little squares with everybody's faces in it. Yep. Are you looking at those faces? Well, you're aware of them, but you're not... Um the practice is to be present and come back. You know, a lot of times meditation has a support. For example, you might be based on the breath or you might be uh, paying attention to the sensations in your body. So, and you're letting, you know, any thoughts, sensations, emotions, sights, sounds kind of be present, but not attaching or focusing on them. Um, okay, so, so this makes them. Okay, sorry, go ahead. You know, the interesting thing is you get to know people really well, actually, when you sit a long time with them, including in silent retreats. I mean, I always felt like one of the gifts of this sort of tradition, and I mean, this is outside the Zoom classes, though I think, actually, I think it's true for that, too, um, is, you know, people get very open and uh, genuine and kind of their best selves. And because there's conversations too that happen, you know, there's a discussion. We already said after the half hour, many people stay for a discussion. So, and you just get to know people. And even when you're silent, like if you were in a silent retreat in a monastery or a meditation center, um, like there's so much communication through body language while you're getting up and going to have your meals or something. You get to know, you also start to see your mind, which is always bouncing off people and having opinions and projecting on them. And so there is actually a lot of communication and a lot of stuff going on in the room, even when you're not talking. As, as a relatively social person, I want to put in a plug for all your listeners to try a silent retreat, because um, it's amazing when you... When you have, when you remove for yourself the need to converse with other human beings, like suddenly your entire relationship with other people and with therefore yourself changes. When 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 the teacher says, "Okay, for the next you know eighteen hours or one day or five days or one month or two years, whatever it is, you you don't need to talk to each other." <laughs> it's like, oh my god, <laughs> everything suddenly becomes very interesting. <laughs> So I would recommend it as an experience for people who haven't tried that before. But when you're doing the Zoom class thing, you don't see people getting up and move. But I, I, I just, I, I totally, I agree with what you're saying, which is that I'm just fascinated by how the human mind can map that, can can draw the same feeling from this 
experience that's mediated by the internet versus all being in a room. And what I'm hearing from, from all of you is that it's not that tough. It's not that big a leap. It's, it, it maps pretty well, perhaps not perfectly, but it maps, which I find fascinating. Um, um, and I think the whole idea, I guess, you know, me being pushing this to its absolute utter edge, which is that if, if everybody did keep their eyes closed, you couldn't see the screen, so you couldn't see other people. But I guess even the idea that there's somebody there regardless, the human mind is so amazing at creating things that are not there. Um, I'm sure we, we can exactly. create an audience as we often, we often, anyway. So I, that to me is absolutely fascinating. Huh, okay. I mean, one, one aspect of it is also whether you see them or not, there's this, um, this community that you're a part of and that is, we're not holding anyone accountable, but there's some community that is drawing that, you know, people together and to and do this together, yeah. and which so, they and wouldn't do on their own, likely. Right. And it's interesting because that's so sustaining because there's no objective evidence of that beyond a certain point. And so it's merely something that you have in your head, but I guess well, everything is that, but there's people have been coming um, for three years almost three years, pretty steadily. Okay. Twice a you know, week. What does that say? Um, and I think when you talk to them, and I know some of the people outside of, of the class itself, you know, unquestionably, they really value the community. Yeah. Interesting. And they value the openness, you know, the sort of no pressure, no no one has to make any guarantees or anything like that. Um, and from my point of view, if someone shows up to to sit over Zoom, instant respect, right? So that there, there's a, I, I know I know that much about them that they, that they are willing to work with their minds for thirty minutes uh, on a Tuesday morning. That's impressive, and you know something got them there. Um, so I mean, there, I, feel like I think a lot it, of people feel like, you know, the original name for the group was the, um, morning meditation group. And in a lot of ways, that's what it is. It's just this half hour or maybe 45 minutes if you stay around for the conversation. And it's a time, it's just a lovely way to start your day. It's like you sit down and you relate to sanity and a little quiet and groundedness and presence instead of the, you know, usual roll out of bed and, Oh my God, where's my to-do list? And I'm already behind from yesterday and you know, blah, 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 blah. And that that carries through that, you know, it just it's um it's just like a scent or a color that it adds to the day that helps just shift it a little bit. With regard to topics, we've been um we've been going through we had we had done, had we done two rounds of uh, the six paramitas um, teachings by the Buddha? Um, I know we, we, we did two rounds in one, but I don't know whether we had done that whole thing twice before. Maybe it was once before. We did. We now did we're doing it's it's, 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 it's kind of fun. It's like, I think we split the time between sort of Buddhist greatest hits um, <laughs> like the, 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 you know, the, 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 the paramitas and the four noble truths and all the sort of classic Buddhist right. categories as interpreted by these four Americans, um, you know, to the best of our ability and then just sort of free form, you know, just sometimes we do what's coming up with for me, or sometimes we just do silent sitting. It, it, it's got this lovely organic aspect to it that makes, I think makes it work better for us probably. And hopefully for the folks who come, it's just like, you never exactly know what you're going to get when you log in on Tuesday or Thursday morning. What really strikes me is that even on days when I don't feel like I have anything to offer, um, just seeing the people there, inspires me to show up and to um you know if if i could do nothing more than hold the space which is 
Lionel is kind of ironic and weird because you're not holding any physical space. You're not like kind of welcoming people into a room. You're welcoming people into their living room with you. Um, <laughs> but there's a certain amount of attention and intention that changes the the feeling of the room or feel the feeling of the session. And um, I guess, you know, having a certain amount of respect for the people just for the showing up, you know, and, and, and endeavoring to do this um, inspires me to, to show up myself. And you mentioned the, the, how many, the parameters? Six. Okay. And I can, um, I'm not sure I can rattle them off from memory. Um, today, Catherine taught, uh, was diligence, but uh, you taught, actually you taught it as discipline. Is that right? Um, and um, Matt, did you teach one of the parameters last week? You did not. I taught it. I taught on generosity. Generosity is the first. Um, there's uh, also a kind of an ethics, um, right action. No, not right action. Sorry, there's something else. <laughs> That's the eightfold path. Um, but it's uh, it's related. Uh, and then I I think I'll be giving a talk on patience. On is there Thursday. is there a pr the reason why I ask is because I hear about these lists of things. Is there a is there a process to meditation? Is is there is there an actual series of steps to to get some, or is it purely free form? It's just like you know, you know, do your thing. Or is because uh, I, I hear a lot about these these steps and, and these categories and these things, and and part of my brain is saying, yeah, that's the way you do it. You have this structure that you can cling to. And you use that as sort of a ladder to sort of climb up or climb down to to get to. So it's not just completely like hit it, improv. You know, I'm, I'm you know just tell me what you're thinking. It's like that tends to like freak people out. People, it often helps if there's a lot of structure, which helps calm calm people down and, and get them past like that initial minute or five minutes when you know, the brain is all topsy turvy, but, or maybe I'm completely making this all up. No, 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 there is, there is, there's a structure and there's how we lead. Pe I mean, there's a lot of ways it said, there's literally said there's 87,000 ways to meditate. Um, we don't teach 87,000 ways, but there's a structure, you know, there's a beginning, a middle and an end to the sessions. You know, you start by, thinking about your intention and then grounding yourself in the body. And then usually we do a, you know, the most popular meditation in this country is a meditation on the breath, what's called an object of meditation. It acts kind of like scaffolding to, to give you. Cause like, I mean, I think your comments are really insightful, Lionel. I mean, to say to someone, just come in here and, and be an empty space and be with your mind. That's, that's a lot. It's an interesting exercise to do every now and then, but it's a lot for, for most people. Uh, right. Sometimes we'll finish the sessions like that, though. You know, as people's minds stabilize and, and they open and, and relax, you know, th then you're able to be a little more open and be present to sort of the to totality of what's going on. So a lot of times we'll take 15 or 30 seconds at the end to just, like, stop meditating and just be present. Mm. And then we always end with a, a chant we call dedicating the merit. Um, just make an aspiration that of any um, sanity and decency and good, you know, that we've aspired or, or done during this time, may everybody may benefit ourselves and everybody. Mm -hmm. This is really, you know, trying to keep the, it's really not about, it's most powerful. It's really not about self-improvement. Um, you know, it's, and it, you know, I, the other thing I'd say, it's funny, I'm just reflecting on like, why does it work? You know, the, on Zoom, I think, but part of what you discover, you know, through the meditation is this sort of profound and inextricable connect, kind of connection you have with everything and everybody. So you become more attuned to people, actually, in the that's where some of the dedication comes in. Mm. 
something that's new for me um, in the way that we've been teaching. And we do follow, I realize now we follow a very similar structure. So it wasn't sort of agreed upon at the beginning, but I think I mostly followed Jim's lead. Um, we do give some instruction while people are sitting in silence. So it isn't the typical, uh, the 20 minutes isn't completely silent. We are kind of encouraging, sending, like saying some, I don't know how to say this. We are, and it's tricky to do because you don't actually want to be constantly thinking about what you're going to say next, but there is, right? Right. You're not really modeling very well if you are, but, but something will come up, you know, even, even if it's like, you notice that you're becoming distracted then okay, well, so, you know, if your mind wanders, uh, just bring your attention back, your awareness back to the body breathing and sitting or, and we all have a different style of, of doing that. So throughout there is a kind of a soft instruction to keep people on track. And then, um, and also, yeah, Jim has sort of started the process of opening with an intention that, that, um, the work that we do will actually be a benefit to other people. And then just before we kind of close and dedicate the merit, um, there's, a uh, uh, a moment where we do this thing was non-meditation, which is kind of formless and open. And um, that has been, that's been new to me. I, I find that, I find that fascinating. Um, we just say, stop meditating and just be. <laughs> which you'd think, you know, this is crazy, but it right. seems to be very effective. What, what do you mean by dedicate the merit? I'm missing right. something. I think there's a long tradition of this, and, and I'm not good with tradition. Uh, Matt or Catherine maybe can could speak to what that means. Well, <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, it's sort of up for debate, too, I suppose, like what it even, um, what it means or what benefit it is. But in the Tibetan tradition, and I think in most Buddhist um, traditions, there's a notion that if you do meditation um, and a lot of things that we do that might be of benefit to others, that we want to share whatever benefit that we received from that, we want to share that with the world. And so it's really strong in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that we all sort of studied in is to... Um, acknowledge sort of any benefit you we received and to want to share that so it's just and, this verbal it's this verbal chant sort of saying you know may may all beings um benefit okay yeah it's an unusual thing i think a lot i certainly have always struggled with this notion of dedicating the merit it's a it's just it's a it's sort of a foreign notion for our sort of Western culture. It's an unusual choice of words. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to figure out, but it's basically just a term of art. It's just something that's been handed down as representing this idea of, of we give back and we give back the benefit. Okay. But I mean, I mean it's not that complicated or, I mean, it, 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 the, the idea is that like, um, as Catherine said, like, if there's any good that has come out of this last half hour, may I share it with everybody else? Okay. And that, that's kind of just this aspiration and does it actually work? Like who knows, but like it, it, by making the aspiration that um, any benefit might spread out beyond just a me, then I think there's some, um, there's some good that comes out of that aspiration. Oh, absolutely. The sentiment is just uh, literally just the words dedicate the merit. That sort of threw me yeah, off a little bit, mm, just those choice of words. But, but I mean, the sentiment makes perfect right. sense to me. Um, it sort of goes in line with what Jim Rosen was saying, which is, you know, self-improvement is all well and good. Um, but part of it is improving yeah, others. Exactly. A big part of it. Right. And there's something to it. I mean, in a, in a sense, if we take a moment to calm down and um, steady ourselves, then that may have some effect in terms of all the, inter all the people we interact with throughout the day. 
So, um, and then that may affect the people that they interact with. So that, you know, we're, we're socially connected and um, we're not just improving ourselves. We're trying to, you know, build a calmer, small society, our little circle that might grow bigger as it sort of radiates out. Hopefully I didn't I'm, get I'm that I'm curious wrong. how this is all striking you, Lionel. Like, no, it's, I'm, I'm just keeping my, I mean, I, I could, I could rapid fire a whole bunch of questions. Um, Your questions are away, all good, Lionel. Uh, so actually I'm, I'm out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Scratch that. I'm out of questions. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it, that's sort of the edge of my, of my knowledge is, you know, I was asking about the structure um, and I think what was interesting about what you said, Catherine, is there's a big difference between a bunch of people getting together on Zoom and a bunch of people getting on, together on Zoom who have gotten together for the past year. And there's something hugely different about that. I mean, if you just have a Zoom call and somebody shows, hi, I'm Tom. Hey, Tom, how you doing? That's one thing. But if it's also, but if you say, hi, you know, and Tom's been showing up and you've been showing up for a year. That's a different thing altogether. And I'm always fascinated by how the human mind, you know, how powerful it is. We, we, we attribute human qualities to animals. We, we create spaces. We create community. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, we can illuminate the world um, with our thoughts of community. So I think that's very, very interesting. And like you said, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, I, I come from a higher education background, and certainly the COVID-19 thing, um, to quote William Gibson, um, it was like a board researcher mashing their thumb against the fast forward button because COVID-19, it, it didn't necessarily change anything, but it basically blew us through about 10 to 20 years of evolution really quickly. Um, and it's and it reshuffled the deck for a lot of people. And it's interesting how um, it seems this seems to be a slightly nicer version of that, which is discovering that you can create these communities over Zoom. Um, but that's that's the that's sort of what I've got my questions right now. I don't want to suck up more oxygen. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Uh, we we have been going for almost an hour, and maybe we should um, start to close. But um, I love what you said about that the mind is so incredible, and I think that's actually kind of the whole point of what we're doing is that we're we're experiencing the mind. Uh, we're we're um, we are um, finding out what kind of mind we have, and best way to do that is to stop. Um, stop distracting ourselves. Can we say something about how people might so, be able to find us? Oh, do you want to go ahead? I, sure. I'm usually terrible well, at, at, uh, at We meet kind of every uh, Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 9.30 a.m. Um, Eastern Time. And everyone's welcome. There's no charge. If you go to mindfulaware.com, M-I-N-D-F-U-L-A-W-A-R-E.com, uh, you can just sign up and you'll get a copy of the Zoom link sent to you by email. It's really that simple. Site built by our wonderful webmaster, Jim Infantino. A pleasure. A pleasure to do it. Um, it, it does require uh, an invitation. Uh, Zoom bombing during meditation is uh, not encouraged. So, uh, <laughs> it can be a little distracting, oh, but maybe we can work with it. Who knows? Um, uh, have I have I touched on the topics we we would want to discuss here? Did I leave anything out? I mean, the only th thing I'll add in closing is just um, I think one of the different differentiators between meditation and most of the things that we do, and as Americans, is that we um, you know meditation is much more about the experience than the knowledge. So don't feel any hesitation if you don't know about the different numbers of paramitas or noble truths or whatever, it doesn't actually matter at all. This is a very human thing. And so um, really the, the, you know, the offering is just to come and sit together and be together and 
see what your mind is like when you're not filling it up with other stuff. So please join. I do have another question, which is I find personally, one of the things that relaxes me most is being yeah. out in nature. Walk through the forest, sitting by, I grew up in New England, um, and I'm very used to like babbling brooks um, and wooded areas. Um, and I miss it. I miss it a lot. Um, and, and nature was always a, a huge, uh, maybe very happy. What's the relationship between nature? If there is any, maybe there's none, but is there, is, is there, uh, is there a discussion of how nature relates to meditation or does meditation relate to many, many different things? Nature is one of them, but you know, there's, there's a lot of other experiences in life that, that, uh, are related to meditation. Catherine, do you have thoughts on that? I was or? thinking Matthew. Yeah. I, I'm picturing Matthew hiking and skiing. But I I, I totally agree with you. The, um, I also find lots of solace in nature and bubbling brooks would make me totally happy. Um, mm -hmm. You know where I, there are awesome bubbling brooks is... Um, Oh, what now is suddenly escaping me. It's not the Catskills. South of the Catskills in um, Pennsylvania area. Oh, what's that? Okay. Area? What's that area the, called? Uh, well, there's Colin. Scranton, like there's Northeast, there's Northeast, there's NEPA, which is Northeast PA, which is like Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. Like the Shawangunks. Uh, I don't know if that's where that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like a, there's yeah, another sorry. term like Catskills, <laughs> but it's South. Anyways. Poconos. 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 Yeah, uh, Poconos. Poconos. The Poconos have the most wonderful the <laughs> waterfalls and streams and brooks, and it's so relaxing. Um, but in your life, Catherine, is there is is so nature, but is there another experience? Is there something that you do? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Is there something else that you that that you do or Matthew or anybody that's like, wow, this is a yeah, lot of like meditation. Like I, I get the yeah, same no, 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 it, doing this. it definitely, definitely. Definitely. Or definitely. you know, sometimes the analogy I yeah. people use, it's like you've had these experiences you have in meditation, this space and this peace and this calmness and this ease. Like if you're on taking a hike through the woods on the side of a mountain and all of a sudden you saw a big vast sky and you just sort of look down and you're connected and yeah. your jaw drops and your mind stops, you know, it lets you, and they're connected. As a matter of fact, it's often recommended to go out and meditate in nature. I personally, I try to take a walk every day, you know, in my, what look passes for woods in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, and it's, I do. It's part of my meditation, and uh, and I'm not the. I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, so I think it would help you capture some of those qualities in San Antonio on Zoom during a busy work week. Yeah, you should come. You sound like you. You would be. Uh, uh, you know, Jim did more of us. <laughs> I'm irredeemable. We, we, those are our favorite people, actually. My mind is unfixable. I think, uh, Lionel, one thing I would say is definitely uh, nature, like being just sitting by the ocean, or uh, that provides a similar um, feeling to just sitting in meditation. Um, there's definitely, but then. But then the meditation practice also makes that experience of being in nature that much richer as well right. because you're sort of more present with that, uh, just sort of the majesty of nature. Okay. One thing I noticed, um, and I, there was a quote by Chogyam Trungpa that um, – he said, uh, people like to travel all around the world in order to have a vacation. Um, I would much prefer to uh, sit in the stillness of yeah. my mind. And I thought, that's a little, okay, that's a bit of a hard sell. I'm not sure I'd buy it. And then I did this silent meditation retreat, 
And I was really amazed because, of course, what you realize is you go to Fiji and you're on a beach and it's gorgeous, but your mind is still your mind. And when you actually take some time to let that constant churning ocean in your head calm down and settle, that's, that's so much better than the beach. That, that, that's like the ultimate vacation. Well, I have, I have two observations on that. One, I've never found travel in <laughs> any way relaxing. <laughs> I mean, edifying, gratifying, educational, yes, but not relaxing at all. My second thing is the divine wisdom of Buckaroo Bonsai. Buckaroo Bonsai. <laughs> wherever you go. Said, remember, <laughs> there you are. wherever you go. There you are. There you are. And I thought, yeah, oh, 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 that's funny. And I was like, <laughs> no, you're right, because you take your head with you. <laughs> right. It's, right. it's, you know, I'm sure he oh, wasn't thinking well, that. Know, let me give you an example you know, for Peter meditation. I, I still have this vivid memory of doing a retreat in a cabin on a hillside in Vermont for like, I think it was 10 days or two weeks. And like a weekend, I'm sitting in this beautiful hillside looking over the trees. I don't think there was a babbling brook, but there was some equivalence of that. And I'm relieving a fight I had with my sister, you know, at age seven. You know, it's like I'm right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you're reliving it you, you know it almost it, it it makes the phenomena of mind almost more vivid um and you start to see you know you start to maybe it's a little more philosophical but you start to see kind of how you construct all these things I, um yeah they have oh. a dreamlike quality to them Goes back to modeling yeah. that we talked so about. So Buckaroo Bonsai was onto something. Different. Constantly modeling the mind is always modeling. I would say meditation retreats are not necessarily enjoyable. It can be really challenging <laughs> and painful. But when you're done, there's this openness and joy that um, is kind of incomparable. <laughs> And yet we get behind the the wheel of a car right away. That's uh, I always found that was a problem. If you go as far away to meditate for like two weeks and then you get behind the wheel of a car and you're like, what is this thing that I'm doing? Um, it seems a little dangerous. Well, teachers, um, I want to thank you very, very much for coming in and talking to Lionel and myself. Yeah, thanks. And and uh, lovely to chat with you. Thank you for setting this up. This was fun. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Lionel. Nice to meet you too. is produced by me, Jim Infantino, music by Jim's Big Ego, this solo by Steve Sadler. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. Please leave a rating or review.